Taika, Legend of a Warrior, Part 3, The High Plains Warrior. It is the 2nd of January in the year of our Lord, 1602. It is in the early morning hours in London. The first session of Parliament is set to begin with Queen Elizabeth I giving her speech from the throne. The country is in the penultimate stages of a war against Ireland. The English have sought to capture the land of the Irish and to bring them under rule. Though the Spanish Empire has been supporting Ireland, Spain is now a power in decline, while the English are rising to take Spain's place as the global guarantor. In Parliament, all of the members are taking their seats. The babble of men constantly echoes through the hallowed halls. The royal music begins and the herald takes up his position. Now presenting Her Ma Britannic Majesty, Queen Elizabeth, proclaims the herald. The queen is escorted to her throne, but she turns around slowly to look at Parliament to see the look in their eyes. She herself is looking much older than she has since last year. There are rumors of her ill health. Those who are found to spread such stories are quickly put down. She sits, followed by all others, and then she begins her speech. By the grace of God, in this year of our Lord, 1602, we are drawing near the end of our successful conquest of the Irish. Our forefathers would be proud of our accomplishments, yet we must not rest on our laurels. We are a nation of conquerors, and we must continue on this path. We are England, and they will remember our victories for centuries to come. Even now, we are sending our new weapon to the battlefront to deliver that knockout blow. There are men that we call the High Plains Warriors. They are a special force using the mysteries of science and their fighting skills to achieve what used to be impossible. They use the power of the elder flower once consumed permanently unlocks the body's access to its electric power. Once it is unlocked, the user can control and manipulate and project that electric power. There is no other word for it. These marvelous men will be a driving force in shaping a new English empire. We will face all other empires and take what is rightfully ours. England will rise and no corner of this world shall be safe from English boots. You are charged with the creation of any law that will catapult us into dominance. Her Majesty stands and is joined by her government. She departs the chamber, walking past her most ardent crit critics. And they are Humphrey Winch, MP for Bedford, and Richard Lovelace, First Baron Love Lovelace, and MP for Berkshire. They had grown tired of her lavish spending to finance the High Plains Warrior Program. 
In every respect, they think that the chiefs, the Queen's chief scientist, Vincent Maddock, is a madman. His experiments are too costly, and his eye colors don't match. A maniac, none the least. They want England to conquer the world, but does it have to be so expensive? This war is costing us too much money, says Winch. If it doesn't end soon, we will have to raise taxes, and we all know what that means. His colleague Lovelace responds, Yes, yes, riots in the streets, people throwing their babies out of the windows. It would be chaos, utter chaos. I have already had to find myself a new baker. I can't go again for months without a proper baker. I could hardly be expected to eat second-rate cakes. Yes, yes, quite right, Miss Bondwinch. But what do we do in the meantime? We should first make our own preparations, just in case of disaster. Then we shall worry about everyone else. Both men agree. Then they retire to their own homes. Although in England all is calm, in Ireland the tension in the air is almost visible. The English boats are landing on the western shores of Ireland. Wedge Pierce and his brother Vincent who are normally farmers by profession, are now at the core of Her Majesty's High Plains warriors. They are rated as the best of the best. They are tall, big, strong men with long hair. Wedge the Elder is clean-shaven, while his younger brother carries a full beard. His hair is brown and as thick as wool. A small scar rests on his left cheek that came from fighting a wolf with his bare hands. Wedge is not much like his brother in some regards. Yes, they are both farmers. They have big families with small children and like the same recreation. Fishing, hunting and jousting. But Wedge is a very efficient tactician with sometimes brutal results. Surely he is a man on the rise. If he does play his hand right and connect with the right people, maybe one day he will become Prime Minister. As the boats hit shore, Wedge is the first to disembark. He lands with his feet firmly in the sand. They are given a few moments to eat something hearty. Wedge stands on a small hill, looking down onto the town below, taking it all in. It is a small and quaint village with people going about their daily to-dos. He is joined by his brother Vincent. I have always heard that it is a nice little country, and it seems that that information was accurate. What do you think? I think that it will do nicely, responds Wedge. Just then, the night commander rides up, ordering his men to march. You will all prepare to march. You will mount your steed. You will ride out. And you will win this victory for our queen, your families, and your country. We will show the world that this is a century of the English. We will, they will fear us. They will respect us. And they will want to be us. Come with me, men. Let us set these Irish ablaze, says the Knight Commander. 
huge cheers from the men bellow in, in and around the small valley as they all ride post-haste headlong towards Kinsale. At Kinsale, the English are keeping up their siege on the town's walls. Their tribuches slowly hit their targets. Urgency sets in as word comes back of the Irish reinforcements in the shape of Ulster forces from the north and Spanish forces keen to prop up a fellow Catholic state. The High Plains warriors ride as quickly as possible. Their job is to bring a swift end to the resistance. The English forces in Kinsale pick up movement from the Irish side. It looks to be an attempt at a counter-offensive. The English heavy cavalry of 100 horses are sent across the enemy lines to crush the Irish will. The Irish are poorly trained with obsolete weapons, but even their regiment of spearmen should be able to break up the cavalry charge. However, in the face of this grave danger, some of the spearmen fall back, leaving their comrades to face certain death. The cavalry smashes through the Irish lines, then turn to continue the slaughter, hacking away at them with heavy blades, slashing left and right. The brutal efficiency of the English laid bare, forces that remaining of the Irish army retreat to seek solace behind their walls. They use archers positioned on the walls to protect the men running away. The heavy horses are forced to pull back outside of the archers effective range. Charles Blunt, the overall English leader, fearful of a counter-attack from the north sends 20 longbowmen to guard the winding road. It has been four full days since intelligence spoke of the Spanish intent. They should be very near by, to the city by now. He calls a halt to the bombardment to send in siege towers. He knows that he will soon be joined by the high plainsmen, but will he try to push instead? But once again, his forces are pushed back. The security of the wall, though not absolute, is causing problems for the English. Blunt pulls his forces back to mull strategy. In the mid afternoon, the high plains. Plainsmen gallop into view. Blunt breathes a sigh of relief. He spends a few moments briefing the night commander, giving over insights into the physiology and psychology of the enemy. With information taken in, the night commander mounts his horse while rallying his men. Wedge is watched over with adrenaline. His heart races as the men cheer. He looks round to his brother Vincent. He cheers loudly and emphatically. Wedge then looks around at all his comrades as they ready themselves. His heart pounds so loudly that he cannot hear anything else around him. That is until he sees his commander point directly at him. Listening closely, he can hear, You lead the charge! Wedge gives a gaze at the city walls. Vincent positions himself next to his eldest brother. They draw their swords, igniting their blades with blue electric pulses, constantly wrapping around the double-edged metal. They ride on, galloping ever much faster as they continue. The Irish archers fire volley after volley, intending to stave off this latest attack. But the High Plainsmen use their ability to manipulate electric energy housed inside their bodies. They project it 
they create a force of energy barrier to deflect the arrows. Four of them jam their swords into the gate, using the electric current to cause an incinerating fire, destroying the gate. The breach is filled with plainsmen pouring into the city. They are soon joined by the rest of the English. Wedge and Vincent gain glory, deftly defeating all the Irish soldiers in their path. They use swords, axes, and electrokinesis and that they have been trained to use. The undertrained Irish don't stand a chance. It is all over in 20 minutes. The Irish leaders have been captured alive. Blunt now has his victory, and the word that the Ulster and Spanish reinforcements have turned back, believing that there is no longer any cause to relieve the Irish. England will now have full control of Ireland. Far away, Nedo, at Toritoga, considers his situation. After two years in hiding from Tokugawa, he is ready to strike back. They have lost many, though too, Tokugawa will also taste loss. The years have passed since the great battle. The battle that we all owned, we enjoyed. We all felt that we would live for a thousand years. We felt like giants. No one could ever defeat us ever again. That is why it is painful, even now, to be in this situation. We have had to hide like rats only coming out at night, like this night. It is only under the cover of darkness can we walk amongst other people through the city. We hide in the city, but tonight we begin want, we want the hope. We hope this will be the first step in regaining the lives that we once knew. That first step just entered his house, just a short distance from our perch, inside these thick trees. Surely he will be asleep, and the untold riches inside his house, as well as his life, will be ours. This mission is a regrettable one, but it is very necessary. We have to survive. We have to push the war back to Tokugawa. We have to take away the money that feeds his armies. He is drinking the tea that his beautiful servant has just served him. <clears throat> Toga's heart begins to race because he knows that it is not long before a nobleman, Akimoto Senji Akuru, retires to his bedroom. Toga's breathing increases. His heart pounds within his chest. The sounds become deafening. It slides out, and all 30 ninja pounce, running from the tree branch to tree branch. Not a sound is made, and not a sound is heard. Their swords remain in their scabbards, avoiding attracting moon glint. Entry points differ as some enter upstairs and some downstairs. The doors and windows are slowly pried open. The assassins ooze in, and sadly, all of the inhabitants must die. There must be no screams and no fights, because there must be a clean and quiet getaway. Toga elected himself for the job of eliminating Akimoto. The attackers kill their way to their primary target, the lord of the house and Tokugawa's nephew. Toga kicks his feet violently to awake him from his sweet slumber. He jumps up to sit, his back to the wall. 
Who are you? What do you want? Yes. I'm Hattori Toga, brother of Hattori Hanzo. We are here because your uncle, Tokugawa Yasu. I am here to kill you and take all of your riches. I have nothing to do with my uncle. Then take up your quarrel with him, not me. The decision has already been made. With one fell swoop, Togo removes his head. And with the eruption of blood, all covers all in red stain. Togo feels nothing. Not pain, not relief, not happiness, not sorrow. He orders the withdrawal, and all of his ninja leave the house with all of the valuable items. The blow has been made against Tokugawa. Soon, Togo will find out what consequences he will face. A world away in Ireland, after the victory at Kinsale, the victory celebrations have begun. All of the men gather in multiple groups of comrades and or friends, singing and dancing and drinking as the cows and the pigs rotate on the spit. The setting sun finds Wedge sitting on a stump all alone. While the men are enjoying themselves with flagons of ale and tasting the local girl, Wedge thinks on his beautiful wife and children. Sheila smiles whenever he says her name and tickles her face. He wonders how she is doing and when it is that he can return to her. He and Vincent are generational farmers, so it is very common of someone in his position to long for home. Wedge often compares himself to the great Viking ruler Ragnar Lothbrok, also a farmer, who brought great prominence to his name. Wedge reckons that he can do the same at some point in his life, as long as Vincent stays out of trouble and become a great man. A hand is placed on his shoulder. It is the hand of a very powerful man, Lord Sir John David Maxwell. He is the Knight Commander. It is his knights that are responsible for protecting the Queen. May I sit down with you, sir? asked Sir John. Sir John, of course, replies Wedge. I saw you today. Might I say, you are possibly one of the greatest warriors that I've ever seen. <laughs> Not better than me, obviously. But I do think that you will have a marvelous future ahead of you. Well, thank you, Sir John. Especially since there's a new battle on foot. New? What is it? Oh, the Catholics are in the place they call Nippon. We are to take the trade and religious opportunity from them. Even now, we are sending into exile Catholics from this very isle. We assume that they will end up in the pond. They will have a ship leaving in a few hours for missionary work. I spoke to their leader earlier, a nice man by the name of Yao Cristobal. Before now, he had no reach into the Far East. But now, everything is changing. Well, I have to leave you to your thoughts. He walks away slowly. Later that evening, Vincent finds himself trying to have it off with a local woman. They move into a barn where they fall deeper into the act of kissing and caressing. But suddenly, she is no longer interested in this event and she tries to get away. Vincent is not having it. He holds her back, forcing himself on her. She screams, she cries, hoping that someone will hear. 
His state of intoxication tells himself that he can continue to try to kiss her. When he realizes that she is not kissing him back, he pushes her to the ground, ripping off her clothes. Just then, a few soldiers stop him, saving her from rape. You're now under arrest, and you will stand charged for assault and to try to commit lewd and lascivious acts. Before Vincent can be placed in irons, he grabs the sword of the soldier that attempts to arrest him and cuts off his leg and beheads the other soldier. He runs to safety looking for his brother. He finds Wedge sleeping in a hammock inside a stable. Wedge, wake up! We have to go! Wedge responds, What are you talking about? We have to leave now. I killed two people and I almost got arrested for rape. Why? Why? By now you can hear men shouting in the distance. Please, Wedge. Okay, responds Wedge. I know what I can take you. They grab their things. Wedge takes Vincent to the port where the Portuguese ship is preparing to set sail. But before they can set foot on the dock, they are engaged by some soldiers. They fight their way through and both make it into, onto the ship. They barter passage onto the ship just as it lifts anchor. The soldiers search the port just as the ship slips the harbor. Back in Edo, it is a few days after Tokugawa's nephew has been assassinated by Hattori Togo. Tokugawa is marching in the funeral procession while holding the picture of his nephew, Akuru Akimoto. There are those that are mourning uncontrollably. A soldier whispers into Yasu's ear, telling him of the loss of three of his farms. Everything is gone, livestock, workers, and equipment. It is too much for him to bear. It causes him to disrupt his steely disposition and to crumble. He falls to his knees and, in, and he is in full a session of tears. He regrets his decision to exterminate the Hattori, but it is too late now to go back. He cannot change the past. Forward. It is the only way. Forward and continue to finish the purge before it reaches, before death reaches his house. Hanzo was like a brother to him. That was, though, only in the past. Over a year on the high seas, Vincent and Wedge arrive in the sea, very near the coast of Nippon. They have seen many things on their voyage. They have seen Spain, the Mediterranean Sea, and Africa. Wedge caresses a pendant that was given to him by his wife. Because of what his brother did, the fact that he assisted his brother's escape means that he would never set foot on England. He too would face the rope. He knows that he may never see them again, but he remains hopeful. It is a lesson in faith that has been taught to him by Father Yao Cristobal the leader on his mission ship. He wants to continue the work of the church, spreading Christianity throughout all Nippon. Father Yao says that he does not fear his death in this new land, a land that does not want Christians to be here. Tokugawa has suspended his complete distrust for now in order to expand the trade 
with the Europeans. Besides, it was still too busy dealing. He is still too busy dealing with Togo to worry about what he could couldn't waste resources on with outsiders. Wedge stares off in the distance, trying to imagine what life would be like in this new land. Father Zhao joins Wedge in this time of unsure, unsure thoughts. You are searching within yourself, trying to find yourself, a self that you cannot find on this boat. But when you are on this land, you must be careful. You are an outsider. They do not trust us. They do not care that we are all different. They will cut you down. If an understanding cannot be met, only a few can speak English. So do your best to learn their language. They will love you. The new ruler, which is called a shogun, he is separate to the emperor. He is like your knight commander, and he is very powerful. He is very ruthless. You cannot trust him. Thank you, Father, for all that you have done for us. Take these coins of gold. You will need them on your road. They hug. As they make land, Wedge and Vincent part ways from the rest of the crew. And after ten days of wandering through the country, they find themselves standing before Toga himself. Although there is a very interesting story of how this came to be. I sit here wondering about these two men, these outsiders. I am told that these men are from England, a far away land, too far for me to care, or should I care? It is a prophecy, for he said that they would come. Now I must do my part. My home is soon to be not my home. The Osaka, the murderous family of fire, the same people that we have trained, we made them what they are. They ambushed my daughters and my bodyguards. They fought very bravely to save themselves. We developed the projection of our key energy to deflect the blast of flames and to push away the enemy. But like always, it was not enough. They would have been dead in minutes, but these men, these Englishmen saved them. They used their power, a power they called electricity. It is like the fire. They control it with their minds. They project it from their hands. They rescued my people. They have brought to me a great, great gift. Tokugawa, in his jealousy, has taken them for his own. They have been hunting us like dogs. We must leave this place. We must go to Korea. We use the number of our two, over 2,000 people. But now, we are only 300. Korea is where we will regain our strength. We will follow the prophecy. We will combine our powers. My daughters must marry these men. It is the only way to fulfill the prophecy. Korea is the best way to escape Tokugawa's reach. China is too weak and too divided. They'll spend years rebuilding and relearning to combine the crafts of electrokinesis and ki. The ki will serve to greatly amplify the other. And one day, in ten years, they will return. 
but not after bringing it into their family. Korean men and women, they will also lend their forces to repel a Nepalese invasion of Korea. They will retake our land and spend centuries in conflict with the Osaka. You have been listening to Taika, Legend of a Warrior, Part 3, The High Plains Warrior. Please like, share, and subscribe to this channel for more episodes of Taika, Legend of a Warrior. You have been listening to Podcast Stories, a production of Infar Media. For more podcasts and entertainment, like and subscribe to this channel.